So good, so good. You guys can be seated. Thank you guys for leading us to the throne of God in, in worship, and, and what a precious time. I am John Hicks, one of the pastors here at the Ave. How you doing today? Awesome, awesome. Good to see you. If you got a bulletin, uh, inside that bulletin is a place to follow along uh, with today's message. I think you'll see some things that uh, are beneficial for you. I want to begin with a confession. And before you get too excited, it's not that juicy, okay? Um, but, but it is serious. I struggle with prayer. I struggle with prayer. And, and that's not a good thing for a pastor, right? We're supposed to be like the special ops guys when it comes to prayer. But I struggle with it. And it's not that I don't believe in prayer. It's not that... I haven't experienced some pretty amazing answers, but I struggle with it. And when Casey asked me a, a few, a month or so ago to preach today on prayer, uh, my response was twofold. Number one, I was really excited because I love preaching on prayer. And then in the same breath, it's like, oh, I'm so unfit to preach on prayer because of my struggles with it. Can anyone identify with that? Have you ever told someone you're going to pray for them, but then you didn't do it? Let me, let me see your hands, okay? Ever posted on Facebook, praying for you, or you're in my thoughts and prayers, whatever that means, and then not follow through, right? Ever, and you really, maybe, maybe you really sincerely meant to pray, but then life happened, and you just forgot about it. That happens, doesn't it? Ever, ever start to pray about something and, and maybe you kept it up for a while and, and, and then you gave up because you, maybe you forgot about it <laughs> or the answer was slow in coming or maybe God didn't do what you wanted him to do when you wanted him to do it and so you just quit. I really identify with, with Jesus' disciples on the night he was betrayed. The very night before his crucifixion, Jesus went out in, into the garden to pray. He took his closest followers with him further into the garden, and he said, you guys, I want you to stay here and pray. I'm going to go a little further to pray. And so they got their spot. He went a stone's throw distance away, got his spot. He came back, and guess what they were doing? Sleeping. You know how many times that happened? Three times. This is the night before Jesus was crucified. This is the night he was agonizing to the point of death. This is the night that he was sweating drops of blood. This was a really hard night, and he asked his closest friends and followers to pray, and he got upset. He said, couldn't you guys hang out just one hour and pray? He was frustrated. But then he said something that... that I lean into, and I want us to lean into today. He said this. He said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's where that comes from, by the way. The grace and compassion that Jesus had for his followers as they struggled with prayer. The struggle is real. Amen? And so today, as I teach on prayer, as we, as we look at, at prayer in the New Testament especially, I don't want to heap guilt on us. I already feel guilty enough with prayer. Let's walk in the freedom of Christ and, and, and walk in his grace and compassion. And I hope that today, through the message, through the word, the Spirit of God will so encourage and motivate us when it comes to prayer. So here's the title of today's message. It's Shaken, Not Stirred. Homage to the most famous misogynist in the world, James Bond. The title comes from the passage we're going to dig, to dig into in a little bit. But the main point I want us to take with us today is this. Don't waste your prayer opportunities. They are miracles in waiting and occasions to brag about Jesus. Let that soak into your heart and your mind and impact your prayer life. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 4. You can just look on the screen. I'm going to read through this uh, several verses for us. So let me set the context 
Um, first, the book of Acts is a book of history. Specifically, it's the history of the early church. And it happened after Jesus was crucified, then he was resurrected, then the Holy Spirit was poured out, and the church started. So Peter and John are in the temple. They're telling everybody about Jesus, which the religious leaders were not happy about because, you know, they killed Jesus on purpose. They wanted to get rid of him. And then Jesus rose from the dead, and the church was launched. So Peter and John are, are in the temple, and this lame man is there, and he's begging for alms. And Peter and John say, you know what? We don't have silver or gold, but here's what we do have. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And guess what happened? He got up and he walked, and he didn't just walk, he danced, he jumped, he praised the Lord. He made quite a big spectacle in the temple. Well, the religious leaders were not happy about that. So they took Peter and John, they arrested them, kept them overnight in jail. The next day they brought them out, they interrogated them, they threatened them, they interrogated them some more, they warned them, they said, listen, you stop talking about Jesus. And they said, you know what, we can't stop talking about Jesus. We've met him. He's changed our life. He changed this man's life. We're not going to obey you. We're going to obey God and keep talking about Jesus. So they were threatened again and released. This is what happens on their release. Everybody got the context? All right, here we go. Then they called them in again, commanded them not to speak or teach it all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes to listen to you or to him, to God. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people. That's the church, okay, the Christians. Went back to the church and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The, th the kings of the earth rise up and rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did, they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider, this is the guts of their prayer. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, here's where the sermon title comes from. You ready? After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. Not stirred. Shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Isn't that awesome? Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the worship we were able to enter into. Father, we thank you for your word and for Jesus, who he is and what he's done for us. And now as we look at prayer, we invite your Holy Spirit to speak through this message, through your word, and we pray that you would do more than stir us. We pray today that you would shake us for our own good, for the hope of the world and for your glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're in this series about greater uh, works, greater expectations. Um, we've set some really bold goals, um, not just the Avenue Church, but here in South Florida. We want to see the number of Christ followers increase from 3% to 6% in our region. And for the Avenue Church, that, that we, we did some metrics and, and looked at what it means for us. It means that in 2019 and 2020, we will baptize 200 people. And guess what? We're on track. That's awesome, amen? Yes, that's, that's worthy clap. It also means we will add 300 new members. We are far from on track for that. So come to onboarding next month, okay? We got, we got to work on that one. But we're seeing lives changed and transformed for the glory of God. And so Casey looked throughout Scripture and said, okay, 
The people that God used in Scripture to, to do these greater works, what was it about them? And so we looked at things like their proximity to Jesus, their, their perseverance in, in hardship, the, the power that, that, they, that they received from the Lord and operated under. And, and today we come to the, the final characteristic that we're going to look at, and that is the characteristic of prayer. As you look at the people in Scripture whom God used mightily to do the, the greater works, to do awesome things, they were people of prayer. Prayer. And so we're going to dig into to what prayer is today. And before, I'm, I'm going to give you like a, a biblical theological framework to work from in your own life, but I, I want to say this first about prayer. You may or may not know this. I don't, I don't know your, your background or experience with prayer. But, but prayer, simply put, it, it, it comes from a heart that says, I can't, but God can. That's prayer. If you think that you can, then prayer doesn't really matter. In fact, that's probably one of the reasons... I struggle and others struggle with prayer. We get in a place where we think, I've got this. I can. But prayer is saying, I can't. God can. Prayer is asking God to do what only He can do. Prayer is you and me coming to God and crying. Here, here's, the, here's the best prayer you could ever pray. You ready? Help. Help. Three guys were, got together, they were talking about you know, postures in prayer. One guy said, you know, I like to pray with my hands folded and my head bowed. Another guy said, you know, I like to, I like to he was a really spiritual guy, he said, I like, to, I like to get on the ground, face flat on the ground before God, that's how I like to pray. Another guy who happened to be an lineman, electrical lineman, he said, you know, I found that my most effective prayer I ever prayed, I was dangling upside down from an electrical wire. help. Asking God to do what only God can do. So with that in place in our, in, in our, in our minds, I want us to look at this biblical theological uh, framework for, for prayer. I'm calling it a biblical theology for heaven-moving, earth-shaking prayer. And five things under this. First one is this. God has ordained prayer as a means for accomplishing his greater works on earth. God has ordained prayer as a means for accomplishing his greater works on earth. Our, our theme verses for this entire series come from John 14. And in John 14, it talks about the greater works we're called to do, even greater works than Jesus, as we see more people come to faith in him and their lives transformed. And, and two twin means that God is ordained for making prayer effective or, or making the greater works happen, it's prayer and the Holy Spirit. Prayer is a God-ordained means for accomplishing the work of God. With that in mind, then number two, a driving motivation for our prayer should be the glory and the kingdom of God. That should drive us, that should motivate us, that should inform the things for which we pray instead of not our personal wants or greeds. Greeds is not really a word, but I think you know what it means. So as we come to prayer, I, I, I'm not talking about what, what sometimes we hear from on, on different religious television. It kind of goes like this. Hello, God, my name is Jimmy, and I'll take all you give me. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about today. There's actually a book that was written. I'm not going to tell you the title because I don't want you to buy it. But the, the, book, the book, the gist of the book, actually presents God as our waiter. And God, here's our order. And it tells you how to get what you want from God. That's not what this is about. Prayer, prayer is motivated, centered in our desire for the kingdom and the glory of God to be manifest in this world. Amen? That's prayer. Now, with that said, number three is also true, and we need to understand this. Our Father, our Heavenly Father, cares deeply for us. 
Our Heavenly Father cares deeply for us, and He wants us to pray for our own and for others' needs. Whatever those needs are, physical, emotional, relational, spiritual, what, whatever those needs are. In fact, at, at the end of the service today, we're going to have a prayer time. Our prayer partners are going to be here. If you've got a need today, I, I think, I'm looking around, I think all of us do, if there's a burden on your heart, or you have a, a, a friend or family member, there's a burden they're dealing with, let's pray for them. Our Heavenly Father wants us to bring those to Him and pray for those things. And then number four, God promises to answer prayers offered in faith and according to His will. He promises to answer those prayers. It's not just about believing He's going to do it, but it's all, it also has to be according to His will. God, no matter how much faith you have, God's not going to answer a prayer contrary to His will. It's going to be in accordance with his will. And then finally, number five, kind of a summary here. We are to pray boldly for greater works while yielding humbly to God's ultimate sovereignty. We are to pray boldly for God to do awesome things. At the same time, we, we yield. It's like, okay, God, not my will, but yours. Whatever you want. And this last point touches on a tension that... that you know, I've experienced probably the last 20 years, really, when it comes to prayer. On the one hand, we have the sovereignty of God, and that's a pretty big word, but what that means is God's large and in charge. He is large and in charge. He's in control of this world, all right? Now, some take that to mean that there's no point in praying because everything that's going to be done is going to be done anyway, whether or not we pray. However, when you look at Scripture, it's like, wait a minute. We, we, have, we have Jesus telling us to pray. We have Paul telling us to pray. We have John telling us. Why are we to pray if it doesn't make a difference anyway? So how do you resolve those two tensions? Well, someone much smarter than I has a really good description, and so I want us to look at this quote from John Piper. John Piper is... is well-known Bible teacher and preacher, definitely has a high view of the sovereignty of God. Look at what he says. This is powerful. It's simply staggering that God, the sovereign ruler of the universe, would ordain that prayers cause things to happen that would not happen if you didn't pray. Whew. That's heavy, right? It's better. Prayer is a staggeringly glorious privilege to be taken by the sovereign God of the universe who runs all things according to his infinite wisdom and folded into his causality. Okay, I don't know what that meant, but it's pretty good, right? <laughs> if you are offered the privilege of engaging with God in such a way that your request could bring into being things that would not otherwise come into being, not to avail yourself of that privilege is folly of the highest or the lowest order. Huh. You know what that means? Our prayers matter. Your prayers matter. Your prayers make a difference. Your prayers result in miracles. And it's not because we're some spiritual giant who's learned the secret sauce of how to pray. It's not because we've earned the right to have our prayer answers. It's because the sovereign God of the universe takes our mustard seed-sized faith and he uses it to move mountains. Wow. He gets all the credit and the glory. We just get to go along for the ride. And that's a ride I want to go on. Prayer. That's why I can say don't waste your prayer opportunities. They are miracles in waiting and occasions to brag about Jesus. So with that foundation in place, let's dig into today's scripture and see what we can learn 
about how we should pray. And I want to give you several takeaways here. Number one, how, how should we pray? How, how to pray these prayers that, that move heaven and shake up earth? Number one is this, pray immediately and keep on praying. Pray immediately and, and keep on praying. Back to Peter and John, they healed the guy in the name of Jesus, which is a prayer, by the way. Arrested, thrown in jail, interrogated, threatened, released. Upon their release, right after they were released, guess what they did? Look at it here. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people, the church, and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they, the church, heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. How should we pray? Pray immediately and, and keep on praying. You know how not to forget to pray for someone you promised to pray for? <laughs> Stop and pray. Stop, drop, and pray. <laughs> right then. And instead of, you know, sounding all spiritual and trying to be caring, which I know is good, instead of, you know, I'll pray for you. So you know what, can I pray for you right now? Doesn't have to be a long prayer. Doesn't have to be a loud prayer. Just pray. Stop, drop, and pray. At work. Tomorrow when you go to work. Or wherever you're going tomorrow. I, anybody have any complainers around you? Yes. Did my wife raise her hand? She, She prays to ask her, thanks. Thanks, dear. I'll pray for you. <laughs> How about, in a truly loving way, someone's venting about something, say, hey, can I pray for you? That sounds like a really hard situation. You know, I don't like our boss either. Let's pray for our boss. <laughs> Let's pray for our attitude toward our boss. Stop, drop, and pray right then and see what God does with it. This afternoon when you go home, hopefully God is stirring your heart up about something you need to pray for. As a family, even in the car on the way home, say, you know what, let's, let's pray for X. Let's pray for that. And here's the cool thing. Sometimes miracles happen instantly. God answers instantly, which is awesome when you get to be there for that. Um, I got to be present for an instant miracle. Um, I, I can't tell you the story. My wife said it's gross, but it's a really good story. You can ask me about it later. Sometimes, though, prayers take a long time. And so the Bible tells us to be constant in prayer. Look at this next passage. I love this from, from Jesus. This is Jesus who writes this. He says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Now, here, here's, here's a cool thing about, about the Greek language. It's a very specific tense that's used there in the Greek language that the New Testament was written in. Here's what it means literally. And when I share this, you can see why it wasn't put in the translation this way. But literally, it says this. Ask and keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. So how to pray? Pray immediately, but also keep on praying. Don't give up, don't give up on your prayer. Number two, pray urgently. Pray urgently, aware of what's at stake. Look at verse 4, 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Consider their threats. Ever feel threatened? It's not a good feeling, is it? What were they threatened by? Well, a couple of things. They were threatened with jail and persecution. 
They knew that was coming. Jesus promised that if you follow him, you're going to be persecuted. It's not the funnest promise he ever shared with us, but it's one of his promises nevertheless. But I think a bigger threat was here, and that this is the one that really concerned them, and that was the threat of the gospel being prevented from going forward. That's why they prayed. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. We don't want the gospel to stop because the religious and civil authorities want it to stop. We want the gospel to keep going forward. People desperately need the gospel, and God has given us the gospel to take it to them. Amen. And so their prayer had a great urgency about it. Now, now what is the gospel? What is the gospel? Are we talking about good music, gospel music? No, what, what is the gospel? The gospel is the good news about who Jesus is. Let me, let me give you the gospel really, really simply. God created this world to be a perfect place, and it was, and, and humankind enjoyed sweet communion with, with God. It was beautiful. Perfect health, no brokenness, no shame. Just awesome. And then, man sinned. And sin messed everything up. It brought alienation from God, distance, separation. And, and when, you're, when you're distant and separated from God, that, that allows all the, all the brokenness and hurt and pain to come in. There, were, there was death, physical death, spiritual death. And that's the world in which we live today. Have you noticed that this world is not right? God didn't make it that way. Our sin made that happen. Enter Jesus. 2,000 years ago, God sent Jesus. God said, you know, I've got a way to fix this. And so he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, sinless, and Jesus went to the cross, and while Jesus was on the cross, he bore your sin, he bore my sin. Sins we've committed, sins we haven't committed yet. They were all on Jesus. And he didn't just bear our sin, he bore the wrath of God. The wrath of God was poured out on Jesus. He was punished in our place, so you and I could be forgiven. Doesn't forgiveness feel good? Reconciled to the Father, a new heart, change from the inside out. And then we get to start walking in that renewing beauty that Jesus brings to brokenness. That's the gospel. That's why we're here. It's all about Jesus. And the early Christians prayed urgently because they wanted the gospel to go forward. Do you know any broken people in Delray Beach? Do you know any broken people? Um, who's from Boca? Are there any broken people in Boca? I know there's a lot of money in Boca, but any broken people in Boca, right? Rich people are broken too. Do you know that? Any broken people in Boynton? Any broken people in this room today? Only Jesus can ultimately heal the brokenness we have. The early Christians believe that. They believe that. And they prayed with great urgency because they wanted to get the gospel out to those who needed the gospel. The kind of prayer that, that moves heaven and shakes up earth is this kind of prayer that has a great sense of urgency because we know what's at stake. Just a question, just, just a thought. What would, if, if the gospel, just the gospel message, if for some reason the gospel message quit going forth just in Delray Beach, what would happen to Delray Beach? Whew. Let's pray urgently the gospel to go forward. Then number three, pray boldly and expectantly. Pray boldly and expectantly. 
believing God to answer in big ways. Look again at the, the scripture. Look at how they prayed. Now, Lord, consider the threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Is that a big prayer or what? That's a big, bold, audacious prayer. This isn't one of those, uh, excuse me, Lord. Hi. I know you're busy running the universe and all, but I have this little thing I'd like for you to, pray, to, to do for me. If it's not too much trouble, pretty please. Wasn't like that. This was bold. Lord, consider the threats. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch. Do you talk to God that way? God, stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders in the name of your son, Jesus. That's bold. Do you think God was offended by that? Like, how, how dare you guys? down there, be so bold in asking me to do this. You think God was offended? I think God was like, that's what I'm talking about, church. <laughs> Bring it. Let's do this. And he did. And he, look what happened next. After they prayed, they were shaken, not stirred, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the Word of God boldly. Now, does this mean we don't pray for small things? No, of course we pray for small things. We pray for whatever. You may have a toe that is driving you crazy. Pray for your toe. We do pray for small things, but with great expectations for God to answer. And then we sit back and we see what God does. How many of you want to be shaken? I've been stirred. Lots of things stir me. I've been stirred a lot in life. I haven't honestly been shaken that much. We're, we're in a church, you're in a church, if you didn't know, we're, we're in a church that is asking God to shake us up. We're asking God to, to move in our midst in such a powerful way that, that lives are changed for the glory of God, that Jesus' name is made famous here and beyond. And that Satan is put on notice. That's what I want. Look at this next quote. Love this. Someone posted it on Facebook. It may have been you. I don't know. This is a good quote. I didn't know who the guy was who, who said it, but he's a Methodist minister from like a, a century ago. He said this, Satan dreads nothing but prayer. Activities are multiplied that meditation may be ousted. Organizations are increased that prayer may have no chance. The one concern of the devil is to keep the saints from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, and prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, he mocks at our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. Don't, don't you want to see Satan quaking in his smoldering boots? You know? Like, like a schoolyard bully put on notice. Yeah. We're praying, Satan. We're praying. So pray boldly and expectantly, seeing what God's going to do. And then number four. Number four, pray restfully. Pray restfully. knowing that ultimately Father knows best. Look at verses 28 and 29. 
This goes back a little bit in their, in their prayer. It says, they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen, meaning the religious leaders. The religious leaders put to death Jesus. They thought they were winning. <laughs> Don't you like that? It was all part of God's plan. Verse 29, now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. These two verses touch on the tension that we talked about earlier, the tension between the sovereignty of God, who's, who's large and in charge, and then the tension where we were called to pray that God would act. And, and so they acknowledge this tension, verse 28, they, they acknowledge the sovereignty of God even over the crucifixion of Christ. But then they ask God to act on, on their behalf, and God did in a, in a big way. And, and, and I, I, I wish God always answered my prayers in a big way. He has on occasion, but he doesn't always. Can anyone identify with that? I wish he always did, but sometimes he doesn't. And when he doesn't, I, I can rest in knowing that my father knows best. What, what I don't want you to take away today is that, is that you know, God's going to answer all your prayers the way you want him to answer all your prayers, and it's always going to be awesome. It's, sometimes you're going to be disappointed. I think of the Apostle Paul in, in Scripture. Paul had uh, what he called a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was. Lots of theories as to what the thorn in the flesh was. But on three distinct occasions, the Apostle Paul, a spiritual giant, I mean, he's the Apostle Paul. He's a big deal in the Bible. Three times he said, Lord, remove this thorn from me. And you know what God said? No. He said, No. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, and my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Paul got to keep the thorn, but he got more of Jesus, too. I would have rather lost the thorn and got more of Jesus. But Paul ended up resting in the fact that his heavenly Father knows best. Sometimes God answers our prayers the way we want him to answer our prayers, and we're like, yes! Those are the ones we praise the Lord for, everybody knows about. <laughs> Sometimes God doesn't answer the way we want. And we can praise him in that, too. I want to share two stories from my own life where God said no. And uh, disappointing, I still struggle with these to some degree. I have a niece... Her name is Emily Hope. She only lived 45 minutes outside the womb. And we knew that was coming. My sister was told by, by her doctors to, to abort, and uh, she chose life, um, but also prayed earnestly for Emily Hope's healing. We all prayed earnestly for Emily Hope's healing and didn't come, not the way we wanted. She lived 45 minutes. Precious minutes. It was devastating, as you can imagine. God said no to what we wanted. But we rest in him knowing best. Another time God said no in my life has to do with my dad. Uh, two years ago, he, uh, he went into a surgery center that was supposed to be for life-changing procedure. He was struggling with some stuff, and he was too weak to have the surgery, and um, subsequent testing revealed that he had some strange, mysterious illness that no, no one ever even talks about or knows too much about, and he was given two to four weeks to live. I never prayed harder for anything in my life than for my dad's feet healing. I begged I begged, I bawled, I bargained. I was willing to become a farmer in Oklahoma if God would heal my dad. <laughs> I confessed every sin I could think of, even those I probably hadn't committed yet. God said no. Two years ago, Good Friday, God took my dad home to be with him. Hard, hard, still hurts, hurts bad. But I choose to rest. 
the fact that my Father, Heavenly Father, knows best. Sometimes God says no to what we ask, no matter how hard we pray, no matter how much we feel it's right. I, I don't know all the mysteries between, behind how God answers, when God answers, why God answers. I, I don't know. I wish I did. I could figure it out and get that yes answer every time, but I don't think... We're supposed to know. This much I do know. If God only answered one out of five prayers, I would still pray. If God only answered one out of 50 prayers, I would still pray. If God only answered one out of 5,000 prayers, I would still pray. Still beats the odds of winning the lottery. I would still pray. What would happen, what will happen as more and more people at the Avenue Church quit wasting prayer opportunities and start making the most of prayer opportunities? What will happen? I'm not a gambling man, okay? But if I were, I'd put all my money on Jesus. Stepping into our midst, shaking us up for our glory, or our good, rather, his glory and the hope of the world. Amen? Amen. You guys ready to pray? And I mean that. <laughs> Let me ask the worship team to come on up and our prayer teams as well as you guys will they'll line up around the front, our prayer partners. What do you need prayer for today? What's God stirred up? What's, what's he reminding you? What, what burden did you bring in here with you today? And bring that, and let's pray for that. And let's see what God's going to do. Do you know someone who needs God to step into their life? Let's join together in praying for them. And then step back and see what God's going to do. Let's stand together. And you come and you pray. <laughs>